We're back at it. <laughs> hey everyone, it's Molly and I am back at it with another episode of our Secrets series. This is the series where we spill all the tea on your favorite attractions and theme parks, sharing the Imagineering details, the backstory, the history, the little things that make these attractions so very special. This, as requested by you, is Epcot Part 2. Last time I covered six of the most popular attractions here at Epcot and you asked for more, so today I'm covering four more, bringing the grand total up to 10. These are some of Epcot's gems, some of Epcot's oldest attractions, some fan favorites. Enough chatting, let's get to it. If you missed the first Epcot Secrets episode, we talked about the six most popular rides in Epcot. New attractions like Remy's Ratatouille Adventure and Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind, but also classics like Soarin' Around the World and Spaceship Earth. Today's video are maybe a little less of the headliners of the park. They're maybe a more of your low wait time, more luxuriating, relaxing attractions for the most part. Though of course, some of these may be the headliners of your heart if you're an Epcot fan. Let's kick this baby off with an Epcot fan favorite, Journey into Imagination with Figment. And of course, when I say Epcot fan favorite, I'm referring to the original version of this attraction, Journey into Imagination. Journey into Imagination debuted March 1983, just a few months after Epcot opened in October of 1982, and it quickly became a staple of Epcot, featuring a cute little dragon designed by legendary Imagineer Tony Baxter, who also did Splash Mountain, Mountain, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, Indiana Jones Adventure, and many other beloved attractions. Tony Baxter thought, why hasn't anyone ever drawn a figment of your imagination? What would that look like? And through a carefully crafted little recipe that anyone knows the theme song will know, he made Figment, the cute little dragon, which is the figment of your imagination. I'm Figment of the imagination. In the original version of this attraction, guests encountered Figment along with the Dream Finder as they went on a journey into imagination. It featured a popular song called One Little Spark written by the Sherman Brothers, who also did the music for Mary Poppins. They wrote It's a Small World, Enchanted Tiki Room, Great Be Beautiful Tomorrow, more Disney legends, and it became a fan favorite. Especially at the exit of the attraction, there was a rainbow tunnel you could walk through. You could actually meet the Dream Finder and Figment. They used a machine called the Dream Catcher that was hanging on the ceiling. This was a beloved attraction by Epcot fans of the 80s. So when it closed suddenly in 1998, everybody's like, why? Everyone loves Figment, everyone loves Dreamfinder. Disney said, we're actually redoing it, we're gonna make another version of it. And everyone thought, great. Uh, they reopened it in 1999 and it was called Journey Into Your Imagination, but it was missing a few key features. One, the Dreamfinder, gone, never heard of him. Two, Figment. And even Disney themselves has said they underestimated how much people loved that little purple dragon because only two years later, that version of the attraction closed and a year later reopened with this one, which is Journey Into Imagination, with Figment. And while Journey into Imagination with Figment did bring back the popular purple dinosaur, it's still a relic of what it used to be. And uh, many fans are hoping it will at some point get an upgrade, especially because they're making a Figment movie. Seth Rogen's working on it. So I, for one, would like to see Figment uh, restored to his former glory. Today's version of Journey into Imagination with Figment takes you into the Imagination Institute, where famous scientists such as Wayne Zielinski and Philip Brainerd have done some of their work. And we are going to do a tour with Dr. Nigel Channing. Like here, you're looking at the camo-rama as seen worn by Wayne Zielinski, AKA Rick Moranis and Honey, I Shrunk the Children. You've also got Weebo here. He is the assistant of Professor Philip Brainerd and Flubber played by Robin Williams. You are a little hot. Say ah. Pay attention to the overhead announcements as well. They just said paging Professor Brainerd. Can you bring some flubber to the brainstorming afternoon session? Those attending want to bounce a few ideas around. So they make pretty funny jokes throughout the thing as well. <laughs> Along your way here at the Imagination Institute, you'll also see the offices of some of the famous scientists. Again, here's Professor Wayne Zielinski. You'll also see Eugene Higgins' office. And he's important. We're going to see more Easter eggs of his movies on the attraction. But he was the dean at Medfield College, which is featured in the absent-minded professor professor and the computer wore tennis shoes. My favorite Easter egg in the queue though comes from these shelves. If you look around, you may spot a familiar character, one of my personal favorites. Getting ready to board my vehicle and take a tour of the Imagination Institute, but a couple of things to look for while you're on the attraction. In one room, you're gonna have your site tested. Make sure you look at the desk and the whiteboard as you may notice a couple of hidden Mickeys. Also as a nod to that original host of the attraction, there is a gentleman whose office says Dean Finder on it, which is a thinly veiled nod to the Dream Finder. 
Outside of the big computer door, you are going to see red tennis shoes and a sign that says no tennis shoes, as well as a collegiate jacket with a letter M on it. These are more nods to the absent-minded professor and the computer wore tennis shoes. In the scent room, before Figment rudely blasts you with the skunk smell, make sure you look around and you might notice some puns, including nonsense. When you head into Figment's house, you are going to have your world flipped upside down, but he did leave a hidden Mickey for you. Check out his plate of onion rings. And in the final scene, when Dr. Nigel Channing finally believes in the power of imagination, you're going to see all kinds of rainbow colorful things before your eyes. Make sure to take a look at the music sheet. One, it is the music and lyrics to One Little Spark, which is our theme song here. And two, there's an interesting silhouette at the top. That's the dream catcher machine from the original version of this attraction. I say imagination must be captured and controlled. <laughs> I mean, it's just... All right, Figma is clearly not my favorite, but even I have to admit, this purse is cute. It's like a little scrunch purse. It's purple and it has his wings. It's $40. That's pretty cute if you're a Figma fan. I don't have anything against Figment. I think he's a cute enough character. I just don't have any recollection of writing the original, so I don't have the passion and the nostalgia for it the way that so many people do so. I hope it's re restored to its former glory. I will say they are bringing out a Figment meet and greet next year. They teased that at D23 this year, so I'll be pretty excited to see that. Speaking of nostalgia as like a little bonus tip, if you're ever looking for one, a really quiet bathroom or two, the old school Epcot music, they actually play it in these bathrooms. So I'm not going to film in there because that's weird and probably illegal, but just trust me. Next stop on our not future world tour of Epcot. We are in world nature right now. I always have to remember there's new neighborhoods, but we are stopping by the Land Pavilion. We are gonna not ride Soren. I rode that in the last one of these. We are gonna ride one of the oldest attractions in Epcot, Living with the Land. Since its inception, the land has been all about nature and the land and farming and how we can give back to this beautiful green earth. Now the Land Pavilion is a huge pavilion because of the greenhouses we're about to explore. In fact, it's almost six acres, which is as big as all of Tomorrowland in the Magic Kingdom, just this pavilion. And before we even get inside to the Land Pavilion, I wanna talk about these beautiful mosaics that span either side of the entryway here. They were designed by an artist named Walt Paragoy, who was a Disney animator and worked on films such as Sleeping Beauty and 101 Dalmatians as a background artist. And then he became an Imagineer, but he drew these beautiful mosaics and then they were actually tiled by mosaic artists Sharf and Sharf. Sharf and Sharf are a father and daughter-in-law team of artists that have done beautiful work, some of which you may be familiar with. Han Sharf, the father on that team, is also responsible for doing the mosaic inside Cinderella Castle as you walk through the breezeway. The thing about Han Sharf that does not get brought up very often but is one of the craziest pieces of Disney history is that prior to being a mosaic artist here in the United States, he was a soldier. And he was actually known as a master interrogator. He was an incredibly successful interrogator for his country in World War II. His last name is Scharf. He is German. So I'm gonna let those of you who wanna figure that out, figure out what I'm trying to tell you. And think about the fact that that person has designed two of the most famous pieces of art in Walt Disney World. And I think that's unbelievable. <laughs> anyway, there's over 150,000 pieces on this mosaic. Some of them Venetian glass, some of them real gold, marble. Beautiful artist. Beautiful. How? How did that happen? How? Who let that happen? And if you know anything about these murals, you know that of those over 150,000 pieces, there is one tile that plagues people with question. Let's go find it now. Now these two tile mosaics are almost identical, sans one. Tile, we're headed to find it. Do, 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 do. Oh, there it is. See that little green one? If you go over to the other side. Oh, 
in the same spot, there's no little green one. There's actually several different stories and rumors and legends about why this one green tile is different than the others. Some have said that it's Monica Scharf, Hans's daughter-in-law's birthstone, so she put it here. Some have said that the two artists just wanted to make one thing different between the two murals. I actually read an article today where someone called and interviewed uh, Monica uh, herself, and she said simply they couldn't find a gold tile, so they just put a green one there. So. Believe what you want to believe, but just know this is the only tile that's different between the two murals, and it's kind of fun to hear all the different legends and rumors. Scooting into the Land Pavilion, again, we are headed down to the Living with the Land boat ride, but there's plenty of other things to do here as well. You've got the Garden Girl Restaurant, which is a character dining experience with Mickey, Pluto, Chippendale. You've got Soaring Around the World. You've got Sunshine Seasons. You've also got Awesome Planet, a movie all about the Earth that will make you feel just terrible as human beings um, for what we're doing here. But one thing I like to point out, I may have pointed now that's before but if you look up here you've got the four hot air balloons they actually represent the four different seasons you've got summer with the birds fall with the leaves winter with the snowflakes and spring with the butterflies i love the lobby area of awesome planet with this sweet 80s carpet wall um and there's no one in here since the show's just starting so i'm going to use this time to talk about a few things about living with the land specifically. I don't like to talk on the attractions, that's annoying. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a few things to look for and then we'll go right in. If you watched our Epcot 40th anniversary throwback to 1982 video, you may remember that Living with the Land opened as Listen to the Land and it actually had narrators with you right on the back of the boats and talk to you as you went throughout the exhibit and the greenhouses. No longer do you have a narrator on the boat with you, you'll have overhead speakers, but you are gonna travel through a few different biospheres um, and environments before you head into Epcot's greenhouses. This music is loud, right? A few things to look for when you're going through the different environments at the beginning. First of all, you might notice the buffalo and the prairie dogs in the prairie scene. Those were actually made for an attraction called Western River Expansion. It was gonna be in Magic Kingdom and Frontierland. It never came to be, but they had the animatronics just sitting collecting dust and Imagineering. And considering the land's all about reduce, reuse, recycle and respecting the environment, they thought let's recycle these animatronics and plop them right here into living with the land. Also in the farm scene, there's a couple cool Easter eggs. First of all, the chicken is sitting on the mail box and he's clucking you'll notice that the house is number 82 that's a nod to 1982 the year epcot opened you'll notice a dog sitting on the front porch as well barking that is a um designed after walt disney's dog himself and it was the same dog used in both carousel of progress and pirates of the caribbean also if you are eating at the garden grill which is that slowly rotating character dining restaurant i pointed out you can actually look into the top story of the farmhouse and it's loosely designed after walt disney's childhood home on his farm in marceline missouri of course, the highlight of living with the land is going into the Epcot greenhouses. And these greenhouses aren't just for show. They are real working greenhouses that produce and harvest over 15 tons of food a year. They use it around Walt Disney World, primarily in Garden Grill and Sunshine Seasons, Chico, and part of that bountiful harvest is over 27,000 heads of lettuce. That's why they're all cute in the little Mickey shape. Speaking of Mickeys, there's a ton of hidden Mickeys on the attraction. There are some in the science section. You can see test tubes arranged to be a Mickey, a hose is arranged to be a Mickey in the fishing section. Also in the shrimp containers, you will see hidden Mickeys and hidden minis. And perhaps my favorite fun fact about living with the land is the fact that it houses an award-winning tomato tree. The big tomato tree that you're gonna see when you go to the attraction has the world record, the Guinness Book of World Record for the most tomatoes produced from a single tree. This is from the official Guinness Book of World Records website. The Walt Disney World Company holds the award for the most tomatoes harvested from a single plant in one year. The number, 32,194. That's a lot of salsa. And with that, we are off to ride living with the land and see this award-winning tree for ourselves. I just love living with the land. It's so relaxing and enjoyable. And the behind the seeds tour, which takes you into the greenhouses has returned. So I may have to do that. Let me know if you want us to. Uh, I've done it before, but it's a really fun tour through the greenhouses. And it's something that maybe you haven't done before at a theme park. Uh, maybe you haven't done that and you're looking for something you need to do. You can go into the greenhouses if you so desire. Continuing on with our relaxing tour of world nature, gonna head to the final pavilion on this side of the park before I go across the way to World Discovery. 
And if you watch the other video, you're probably wondering, wait a minute, she already did Test Track and Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind in the other Epcot Secrets video, and that only leaves one attraction in World Discovery to discuss and ride. And um, probably figured out why I saved it for last. If not, we'll be there soon. But for now, we are headed into the seas with Nemo and friends. The Seas Pavilion opened in 1986, of course, without the Finding Nemo IP. It opened as the Living Seas, which took you on a fantastic journey under the water to the sea floor to visit the sea base, where you would see all kinds of aquatic creatures and then get to explore the different aquariums. It still has the same vibe. However, now the dark ride portion of it does contain the characters from Finding Nemo, and it's a dark ride through that film. But you do end up in the sea base where you can see all different kinds of animals. In fact, there are over over 3,000 different animals, over 200 different species of sharks, dolphins, fish, turtles, and more. The Seas with Nemo and Friends is a great family attraction. It's one of my favorite underrated things to do at Epcot. It usually doesn't have too long of a line. It's a really cute dark ride. Kids tend to love the Finding Nemo story, and bonus for me, it has sharks in it. One of the coolest parts of the redesign of this attraction into Nemo and Friends is the queue. It takes you from the beach and then under the water in the Finding Nemo story. And of course, there's a couple queue things to look for along the way. I love this sign right here that says, please do not feed the seagulls. Because of course, if you listen outside, you can hear those birds shouting for any kind of scraps. Take a look at these signs right here. A couple more hints as to what you're about to see. Shark sighting warning. Uh, and then if you look closely, you can see it is actually Bruce, Anchor, and Chum, the three sharks from Finding Nemo. The pelican is Nigel. The turtles are Crush and Squirt. And the fish in the reef is Dory. So you've got all your characters right here. The best sign though, besides the shark one, is probably this one here that says fish are friends. Fish are friends. Not food. The queue continues until all of a sudden you are under the water with Nemo and friends. And while this ride doesn't normally get a long line to fill all of this up, if you pause for a second, you'll actually see the school of fish over here making different characters and shapes. It's supposed to be a game that you can play along if you're stuck in a long queue, but it's fun to kind of stand and watch it for a little bit. Like they just made the castle. <laughs> and this detail here might be the biggest one, but also one of the most overlooked. If you look up at the ceiling in this next room, you're actually going to see the boat or the butt. He touched the butt. That Nemo touches that turns out to be the dentist that captures him and puts him in the aquarium. But people don't tend to look up, but there it is. Nemo swimming out to he. Even as the anchor, how cute. And now it's time to board our clam mobile and head to see Nemo, Bruce Chum, Anchor, Marlon Dory, and all their friends. See you in the sea base. That's jellyfish. You're good. I think that attraction is so adorable. I love any dark ride that puts you into the middle of a movie, but for me, the real highlight of this pavilion is the sea base, which you don't actually have to even ride the ride to enjoy it. You can just come in through the back way. But here at the sea base, they have all kinds of exhibits. Like I said, they've got sharks, rays, turtles, dolphins, fish, including some fish from Finding Nemo that we can go look at. Head in this way to the Ocean Life exhibit. It's all about reef ecosystems, and you can actually see some of the fish from Finding Nemo. You can also see one of my dearest friends who I'd be remiss if I didn't come say hello to first. Hey, Mr. Eel, how are you, buddy? Well, hey, Molly. Hey, ma'am, fam. How are y'all? You know we're doing well, Mr. Eel. I was just coming in here to, to show them Dory and Nemo and Marlin, their inspiration from the real life. Well, yeah, I'm a little sad that um, an eel like myself wasn't in Finding Nemo. But um, I guess my friends were in Little Mermaid, but I know you're not real fond of, of that. Well, you know, I like the movie The Little Mermaid. I'm just not real fond of Ursula, though I do 
I do know your relative Slotsam and Jetsam made an appearance. But anyway, uh, I'm going to go show them the clownfish and the tangs and just wanted to say hey. Wish you uh, and the missus a happy holidays and a happy new year. Well, thanks, Molly. Thanks, ma'am, fam. Love y'all. Bye. Happy holidays. Gosh, he is just so polite, isn't he? Anyway, here in this uh, aquarium, you will see some coral, and it's actually moving, and it's so crazy. Coral, like, blows me away. But uh, scientists call coral the rainforest of the sea because there's so much wildlife and so many different ecosystems that survive within the coral. But within this exhibit, you can actually see the fish that inspired Dory, Ellen DeGeneres fish, uh, and it's the blue tang, and it's right here. Look how pretty it is. So beautiful. If your kids aren't sure about the aquarium, I think bringing them to show them the real Dory and the real Nemo would be a very fun way to do that. Now this is interesting. Clownfish stray no farther than one meter from their home in their entire lifetime. Nemo, that feels like a lie. Is that a lie, Marlin? Feels like you went a little further than that. Another animal that's fun to come visit are the manatees. Look, here he comes. The manatees, like some of the others here at the seas, are rescues. Unfortunately, manatees get involved in a lot of boating accidents because they're so slow. So people often hit them with their boats thinking they're logs. Um, and then they'll have, you'll see like one of them is missing part of his tail. So they'll try and re rehabilitate them and re-release them if they can. Um, but unfortunately, they can't always do that. So these manatees uh, live a pretty good life here at Epcot now instead and can teach us about manatees and how to protect them. Look how cute he is. He's like all floopy. He's massive. Speaking of rescue animals, at one point, oh, at one point, one of the dolphins was actually a retired Navy dolphin, which is really cool. And they actually do dolphin research here. You can do different tours here as well. You can actually scuba dive with them. If you'd like, there's a tour all about the dolphins if you'd like to learn more about them. Let's see if we can find them. There they are. They're so beautiful. Aw, sweet babies. And when you pop up to the top level, you can see the biggest exhibit. You're gonna see all sorts of fish, turtles, rays, sharks, which are my favorite part, of course. When this aquarium opened, it was actually the largest saltwater aquarium in the world in 1986. It is now the second largest saltwater aquarium in the United States behind the Georgia Aquarium up in Atlanta. But there are 5.7 million gallons of water in this aquarium. If you were to siphon off just one inch of the aquarium, you could fill Spaceship Earth. And this large exhibit exhibit is over 200 feet in diameter, which means you could fit Spaceship Earth inside of it. Ooh, there's some divers in here. I wonder what they're doing. It looks like they're cleaning. Wouldn't that be a wild job if your job was to clean? <coughs> the tank is clean. I wanna find the sharkies. I wanna find the sharkies. I found the sharkies. Eek, I love you. Just floating right Look how beautiful they are. You've got a sand tiger and a bonnet head, it looks like. The bonnet head is um, closely related to the hammerhead. One question I've heard several people say out loud, and one I've certainly thought of as well, is why don't the sharks eat the fish? Uh, and there's actually two reasons. One, they're full. They get fed mackerel and halibut and really fatty, delicious things that are more appealing to them than the fish in this tank. So they don't feel the need to go hunting for them. They're conserving their energy. And two, sharks are actually a lot smarter than people give them credit for. So they're actually trained. The team here feeds the sharks at night when it's pitch black, except for one light. They shine one bright light on the fish and the sharks know that where the light is, is their food. So they've trained them how to eat, when they're gonna eat. The sharks know they're gonna be fed very regularly so they don't have to uh, exert a bunch of energy to try and catch any of the fish in this tank because they're full and they know where their next meal is coming from. I've never seen the turtles that much. They were so cute. 
if you can't hear it, there's tons of kids in here just amazed by the fish, amazed by the scuba divers. It's a great place on a nice hot day to bring your kids to burn off a little energy in the air conditioning, and I promise they will be fascinated watching the fish for a very long time. I am, and I'm basically a child. The last thing I'll highlight in this area is Bruce's Shark World, where they have a kind of interactive play area with the different sharks from Finding Nemo. Bruce, the shark from Finding Nemo, is named after one of the most famous sharks in all of pop culture, the shark from Jaws. Steven Spielberg nicknames the mechanical shark used in Jaws Bruce after his lawyer, which is actually an insult because the uh, mechanical shark notoriously did not work very well, but that is why Finding Nemo's shark is named Bruce. I haven't been through this in forever, so let's see. Alert human sighted. See, we are more dangerous to sharks than they are to us. We don't want to bite you, but never stick your hand in a shark's mouth. That is good advice. Although, what's going to happen if I do it? I'm Nothing. He's laughing. He's laughing at me. Well, I thought I thought I was gonna touch something weird, like a tooth. Shark Anatomy 101. Eye, jaw, gills, fins, got it. What's the scariest word to a shark? Human. Let's find out why. <gasps> Makeup, yes, squalene. It's made in uh, shark from s shark liver oil. Some companies use that. You can actually get plant-based squalene in most companies nowadays, though. Let's see what else? Shark cartilage. Oh, some people believe it can cure cancer because sharks often don't get cancer, but they debunked that mystery recently. I'm sure that all of these, yep, shark fin soup are different things that humans do when they catch sharks. So we can learn a lot here. That's great. We don't want to bite you. Help us help you. Don't wear shiny jewelry. Splash around. Bother a shark. Go at the dark. Swim alone. Look, I just love that there's a whole thing about why sharks are great. This is my favorite part of that guide. Well, with the completion of Seas with Nemo and Friends, there's only one ride left in all of fake future world. We're headed to Spas. I haven't done all the rides in World Showcase, however. I was thinking I could maybe do a Secrets of World Showcase and show some of the cool details in the pavilions as well. So if that sounds interesting to you, let me know down in the comments. Also, speaking of interesting, some of you might find it interesting that we're getting our first peaks of Journey of Water starring Moana. You can see the very tall Tafiti right there, as well as the entry right here. It's supposed to open up late 2023. Walk through experience with Moana. A quick fact now that we're in World Discovery and on the way to our final attraction today, you might notice that there's actually a difference between the planters here on this part of the park versus World Nature where we just were. Because this part of the park focuses on tech and science and speed and space, they used harder angles in all the planters, whereas over in World Nature, it's a little more soothing, it's a little more calming, less adventurous. You're talking relaxing, luxuriating things like the land and the sea. So the planters over there are all round. It kind of just goes with the general vibe, something probably most people don't even notice, but just another one of those little Disney touches. And yes, I'm sure you've guessed it by now, but our final attraction of the day is Mission Space. Now, Mission Space isn't the original habitat of this pavilion. Originally, it was Horizons, which opened up on October 1st, 1983 on Epcot's first anniversary. Horizons picked up where Spaceship Earth left off. While Spaceship Earth tells the story of communication through the past, Horizons told the story of communication in the future. And in the far off distant future, you'd be able to call, nay, video conference with people across the country, even across the world, perhaps across the galaxy or even under the sea. It was a choose your own adventure tale, Omnimover and people loved it. For some reason though, Horizons became outdated. And so they closed it in 1999 to make way for what we know and some love, Mission Space. But there are a few pieces of the original Horizons remaining here outside of Mission Space and a few nods within as well. The first one is this giant planter right here. This used to house the Horizon sign that welcomed you into the building. And now it's a beautiful planter. During the spring, it does usually house Buzz Lightyear's topiary for Flower and Garden Festival. But this is one of the few remaining pieces of Horizon still here today. 
The idea of doing a space-based attraction is not anything new for the Disney company. In fact, Walt Disney was a man who loved space. And considering this park is basically a love letter to Walt Disney, it's not shocking that they'd want to include something about space in the pavilion. Walt Disney even had space-themed programming on the Disneyland show in the 50s and 60s. He was very interested in the space race, and he wanted to show Americans that space was important and that what the astronauts were doing were an important duty for their country. So he was very pro space, which is also why you have lands like Tomorrowland and, you, and why you've always had attractions like Flight to the Moon and Mission to Mars. And space has always been a big part of the Disney parks. Now, some of you may have realized that that is not an immediate turnaround on closing horizons and opening mission space. And that's because Disney worked in part with NASA for over five years to develop this technology. They wanted to create the most realistic space simulator possible. And when they were done, NASA astronauts said it was the closest they had experience to going to space besides, you know, actually going to space. And the technology was so effective at creating the feeling of going to space, of creating those G-forces, that it also has the honor of being the first and only attraction in Walt Disney World to be equipped with barf bags because so many guests throw up on the attraction. Now, Disney did curb the barfing issue a little bit. When the attraction opened, there was only one mission, one level of intensity. It was a mission to Mars, which is why you see this beautiful red planet out here. But in 2017, they opened a second portion of the attraction called Mission Green, which is the Earth mission. The green mission does not spin as much, so those G-forces aren't quite as intense. The orange mission is the original version of the attraction. So I often say, if you're not sure if this attraction is gonna make you sick or not, absolutely ride the green mission first. If that makes you queasy, do not get on the orange mission. As you're making your way into the Mission Space Pavilion, probably the first thing that's gonna catch your eye is this large planet right here. It's red, it's otherworldly, it's iridescent, it's fabulous. And that's because this is this pavilion's weenie. Did she just say weenie? Yeah, I just said weenie. Weenie is a phrase that Walt Disney himself came up with, and it's his way of saying something that will catch your eye and draw you in. He actually came up with the phrase because Walt Disney loved hot dogs, something he and I do not have in common. Nonetheless, Walt Disney would often be talking and he would have a hot dog, and he would notice that his dog, as he talked and gestured with his hands, his dog would follow the hot dog, follow the weenie. So Walt Disney nicknamed something that would catch your eye and draw you in the weenie. Technically, Spaceship Earth is a weenie. Cinderella Castle is a weenie. The Tree of Life is a weenie. It's something that you can see from a distance, catches your eye, and draws you into that space. And that's exactly what the planet here is supposed to do. To create such a perfect planet, a perfect weenie, if you will, they had to actually custom make the color. They couldn't find one at their local Lowe's that fit the bill. So they worked to make one, and it actually costs over $800 a gallon. Can you imagine? But it was the perfect color to create this otherworldly sheen and kind of ever-changing effect as you look at it and the light touches it in different ways. So it does its job as the weedy. Mission Space, like I said, has two different missions now, the Mars mission and the Earth mission, and they also have two different height requirements. Earth is a 40-inch height requirement. Mars is a 44-inch requirement. I guess I've been talking outside long enough. It's time to go. I lied. We're going to point out one more thing. As you're walking into the attraction, most people don't actually stop to take a look at the moon right here and all of the plaques that go along with it. It details various milestones in lunar and space travel throughout time. Wow, JFK was just on here talking about space travel. But if you look right here, you can see all different space craft that have been to the moon and their names, Ranger 9, United States, and the year. If you look right here, it says, for all mankind, between 1959 and 1976, United States and Soviet Union launched a total of 29 rockets to the moon. And then it has guide here to finding all the moon missions. So pretty interesting stuff. If you've got a kid that loves space, telling you, you could spend an hour in this pavilion. When riding Mission Space, you are actually visiting the fictional ISTC, the International Space Training Center, so you can learn what it's like to train to be an astronaut. For starters, here at this large board, banner, poster, display here between the orange and green missions before you get in the queue. If you look closely, you can actually see the Brava Centauri Space Station. That's the space station from Horizons. Great news. Some friendly, helpful cast members helped confirm some things I'm looking for. The bad news, they said, if you want to be able to see it better, you're gonna to have to go on the orange side. So, we're going on the orange side now. Great. 
For starters, here on the gravity wheel, if you look towards the center here to look at the logo, that's the original Horizons logo of the pavilion. Spaceships, spa ships. There's our spa ship that we're going to be taking on again. NASA and Disney work together to design that. Now we're looking for some footage here in the mission control room. Horizons isn't the only extinct Disney attraction that gets a nod here. If you watch closely, you'll actually see footage of a bird just completely eating it here at Mission Control. And that footage is direct from the pre-show at an opening day Magic Kingdom attraction. In Tomorrowland, there was an attraction called Flight to the Moon, which in 1975 became Mission to Mars. And then it closed in 1993 to make way for the extraterrestrial alien encounter. But it's nice that we're making nods to all kinds of former space attractions here at Mission Space. Apparently there's some hidden Mickeys only on the orange side, which is why I'm riding the orange mission right now. But there's also a few cool things to take a look at in the pre-show. Also in the pre-show, also overhead, also on 100 signs, also with the cast members. They're gonna warn you about this attraction 67 times before you get on it. They're gonna be like, do you get motion sick? You claustrophobic? Are you gonna throw up? Are you gonna throw up? Don't throw up. They, they, they're like, they stress you out. Like if you weren't stressed, you will be. Update. I think when they updated the pre-show to remove Lieutenant Dan and add Gina Torres, they got rid of the Horizons logo that used to pop up. So they better still have the hidden Mickey or I'm riding the orange side for nothing. Attention astronaut candidates. Follow the markings on the floor. Attention trainee trainer and follow the markings on the floor. Select radar, altimeter, internal guidance system, space words, space words, later. Go, go, The good news, I think I saw in the Hidden Mickeys, I read they were on the launch towers and you can see two things on the launch towers as you lean back, there's two like shapes on the launch tower far away. So I think that's them. Bad news, Air Mission Space Orange. I feel okay because I haven't eaten very much today, but woo, does that ride get ya. And now we head to the advanced training lab at the exit, but I've got one more Horizons logo I'm looking for. Take a look at the cash register here and you'll see one more for you. The Horizons logo right there in the middle. There's also this VQ picture of the Fab Five in space. 
And uh, I just really like that Minnie's got her bow on top of her helmet. I respect the need to accessorize even in space. Also, LOL, at this like space photo, Epcot 2003, that's when it opened, and then it's got the different positions. It's just like generic stock family photo with astronauts. I don't know why it's making me laugh. Okay, one last gray hit of Mickey for the road. You don't even have to ride for this one. Look up at the ceiling here in the gift shop and you can see a profile hidden Mickey looking this way. You can see his nose and his two ears right there. That's a good one. Well, with that lovely mission to space, that is a wrap on Epcot's Secrets of the Most Popular Attractions Part 2. Hopefully you learned something new. Let me know down in the comments. Do you want to see a World Showcase version of this? What other parks and rides? Where do you want to know the secrets, Easter eggs, backstories, details? You let us know all of that. In the meantime, friends, make sure to rate, review, subscribe, follow us on social media. And until next time, friends, I'm Molly. And it's been magical. And a little nauseating this time.